This is a clinical case video. When you see this symbol flash, hit pause and have a think about the question before moving on. This way, you'll get much more from the video. You are a junior doctor in a hospital, clerking incoming medical patients. You've just seen a 72-year-old lady called Margaret, who's been brought to hospital by her son. Mum hasn't been right for the last few days. She keeps getting confused about things. Today she keeps getting mixed up about where she is and what time of day it is. I have to tell her things over and over again. She's been feeling well recently, so I don't know what could be causing it. Actually, now I think about it, she has been going to the toilet a lot to pee in the last couple of days. What broad causes would you be thinking of for this 72-year-old lady with acute confusion? Infection, medications, electrolyte abnormality, intracranial bleed, in particular a subdural hematoma, and psychiatric causes. These are definitely not exhaustive, but it'd be a good starting place. Margaret's son also tells you, She's got high blood pressure and she takes a uh, amlodipine for that. She's been on it for years. She has arthritis too. It's been getting a lot worse over the last few months. She takes paracetamol and she also has tramadol for when it's bad. I don't know how many she's been taking though. At the forefront of your mind are a possible UTI, given that her son mentioned her urinary frequency had increased, and also use of tramadol, which often causes confusion in the elderly. You take a quick history from Margaret and don't elicit any new symptoms other than the ones that her son has already described. She's quite sure that she hasn't fallen recently, which may have raised the possibility of a subdural hematoma. She only uses one or two tramadol tablets per week and hasn't had any for the last few days. The examination is normal. A urine dipstick test is also normal. The ECG and the chest x-ray are completely normal. Which initial blood tests will you request? A blood count, renal function with electrolytes, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, liver function tests and CRP and thyroid function tests too. These are Margaret's blood tests. The haemoglobin is 90, the MCV is normal, the urea is 14 and the creatinine is 190, the calcium is 3.12, the phosphate is normal, the alkaline phosphatase is normal. Which abnormality must be addressed first and how will you treat it? Calcium. You're going to treat it with intravenous fluid, for example, 5 litres over 24 hours. Some clinicians always use loop diuretics like furosemide, and other clinicians will wait and reassess the fluid status over time to decide whether diuretics are needed. What is the significance of the calcium in regards to Margaret's presenting complaint? Acute hypercalcemia often presents with confusion, urinary frequency and thirst. Contrast this against the more chronic picture of hypercalcemia which you get with things like hyperparathyroidism which gives the traditional clinical picture of bones, moans, stones and groans. Can you think of a unifying diagnosis which would explain all of Margaret's problems and blood test results, namely anemia, increasing bone pain, renal impairment and hypercalcemia. Myeloma. Margaret has the classic clinical features of myeloma. Although there are of course other potential causes, it's important to consider myeloma as a distinct possibility here. So what tests should you order next? A serum power protein and urine for Benz Jones protein. Let's pause for a second to remind ourselves what these tests refer to. Myeloma is a cancer of plasma cells in bone marrow. 
plasma cells are B lymphocytes that are differentiated into antibody producing cells. As in any cancer, there are many clones of the same original cancer cell, and the result is production of lots of exactly the same antibody. The antibodies are made from two components, light chains and heavy chains. And for reasons that aren't clear, plasma cells tend to make many more light chains than heavy chains. In the blood of the myeloma patient, we see not only an excess of antibodies, but also an excess of free light chains. The combination of these two elements gives us a spike on electrophoresis of blood proteins. Remember that in electrophoresis, we're passing an electric current through a gel which contains a sample of the patient's blood serum. Blood proteins will move different distances depending on their size and charge, and this can be interpreted on a graphical display. Normally, we see a large amount of albumin, but fairly even amounts of the immunoglobulins. In myeloma, there is a spike here because of the large amounts of immunoglobulin and free light chains produced by the cancerous clones. This is known as a paraprotein or M protein and can be quantified and used in a diagnosis and monitoring of myeloma. The free light chains are small enough to pass through the glomerulus of the kidney and can therefore be detected in urine, where they're known as Bentz Jones proteins. This is the traditional test for myeloma. The tests come back and detect Bentz Jones proteins in the urine and the paraprotein in the serum. You refer Margaret to the haematologist who will explain to her the diagnosis of myeloma. What further investigations will be needed and what treatment options will be available to Margaret? Margaret will need a bone marrow aspirate and trephine, which is also known as a bone marrow biopsy. And this should have plasma cell phenotyping, which will aid in directing therapy and advising on prognosis. She should have a skeletal survey, which is a series of x-rays taken of the head, neck, chest, pelvis and long bones. In terms of therapy, initially Margaret will be started on dexamethasone while she has time to make some decisions about the next steps in her treatment. It's advised that she has monthly infusions of bisphosphonate, usually zolindronic acid, to reduce the symptoms of bone pain and reduce the risk of pathological fractures. Because Margaret is symptomatic and there is evidence of organ damage, it's recommended that she does have chemotherapy. If she was an asymptomatic patient with no evidence of organ damage, a watch and wait approach might be appropriate. Fitter and typically younger patients may opt for high dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant, which is associated with the best chance for a longer disease free survival. Older patients might not tolerate the relatively high toxicity of high dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant and may instead opt for a lower dose chemotherapy with less toxicity. The most common agents are thalidomide, lenalidomide and bortezomib, which is known by its trade name of Velcade. Margaret's prognosis is currently uncertain, although we know that she already has organ damage in the form of renal impairment, plus anemia and probably bony deposits causing pain. Further tests like cytogenetics and her response to treatment will give more prognostic information. So in this case, we saw an elderly lady who presented with acute confusion, and we found that her calcium was quite raised in her blood tests. She also had bone pain, and was found to have anemia and renal impairment. Together, these make up the core clinical features of myeloma.